Link TV, connecting you to the world. Link TV is viewer supported. Watch more at linktv.org. Today on Earth Focus, two reports from Sweden. The Talberg Forum explores if we can live within our planet's boundaries. And in Stockholm, the 2009 World Water Prize goes to Dr. Bindeshwar Patak, the man who helped bring toilets to millions of people in India. Is European pork contaminated with the deadly MRSA bacteria? Ecologist TV investigates. And Earth Focus correspondent Miles Benson looks at the potential of renewable energy and the state of America's national parks. All coming up on Earth Focus. is a quiet village in central Sweden, but for five days in late June 2009, it was anything but. It was home to the Talberg Forum, a gathering of over 400 social change leaders from 70 countries who came together to ask if we can live within our planetary boundaries. Scientists have given us a scenario where climate change, if left unabated, uh, would have a catastrophic consequences for island countries like my own. Many of our islands, only a few meters above sea level, will simply disappear due to sea level rise. And if they disappear, they will do so with all cultures. Talk about, in the case of the Himalayan, uh, Hindu Kush glaciers, which provides the headwater for most of the river systems, the Indus, the Ganges, the Brahmaputra, and then the Mekong on the uh, East Asian side. And we're thinking these glaciers could be gone in 20, 30 years. So you're not talking about centuries. When do we start planning for plan B? Because if plan A is to fix this, on the track record of humanity, I don't think we're gonna make it. A plan B needs innovative solutions to the challenges we face, like climate change, failing economies, dwindling energy resources, and the inability of our institutions and governments to address them. Talberg brought together leaders of science and industry, economists, policymakers, legal experts, and social advocates to find those solutions, and to find them the Talberg way by holding a conversation fueled by cutting-edge thinking, inspired by the arts and drawing on the wisdom of nature. The 2009 Talberg Forum called for urgent action on climate change and advanced a number of creative solutions for addressing the challenges we face today. First of all, decoupling growth from carbon emissions. Because, yes, we all want to continue growing, we have aspirations to grow, but we have to now decouple from carbon emissions. For the last 200,000 years that we have been on this planet, we have never decoupled carbon emissions from growth. So this is a new experience. Nothing short of reinventing our lifestyles, our workplaces, the way we interrelate with each other in society. This is, yes, also a national security issue. The other thing that we need to do, we have to decouple our personal satisfaction from consumption. And what clearly science so to say, gives even more pressure on is the failure of the current growth model and thereby the failure of the economic model as we apply it today. So no doubt do we need a total change in how we think about economic development in the world. Can we think about the rights both of nature and of people and perhaps give, so, give some thought to indigenous peoples and others who are already experienced at the front edge what climate change feels like. And think again about maybe there is a need for a universal declaration for nature. The annual Talberg Forum is convened by the Stockholm-based Talberg Foundation and has been held in Sweden since 1981. The concept is catching on. 
Talberg-style conversations are now held in other European cities, the United States, Africa, and Russia. Other Talberg initiatives are linking social entrepreneurs with youth networks around the world to generate employment and protect the environment. We must aim to make good international cooperation to become a national interest. It's not until we realize that a good international solution is in the national interest that we are home. World Water Week brought over 2,000 water experts to Stockholm, Sweden in August 2009. The annual event, hosted by the Stockholm International Water Institute, addresses pressing global water challenges. A featured theme this year was the world's lack of toilets and its devastating effect on the world's poor. More than two and a half billion people in the world don't have access to a toilet. Half of all hospital beds in developing countries are filled with people who are ill because they lack clean water and sanitation. And 5,000 children die each day as a result. Dr. Bindeshwar Patak is changing all that. For 30 years, he led India's Sulab sanitation movement, bringing new sanitation technology to millions and breaking down social barriers in the process. He received the 2009 World Water Prize from Prince Carl Philip of Sweden. The $150,000 award is the world's most prestigious prize for outstanding achievement in water-related activities. Sulab sanitation movement was started to fulfill some of the dreams of Mahatma Gandhi. Good sanitation and removal of untouchability and social discrimination from Indian society. Lack of toilets is a big problem in India. Every day, 100,000 tons of human excrement pollute India's fields and rivers. 75% of the water is contaminated by human and agricultural waste. This leads to illness and loss of productivity, which clips 7% off of India's gross domestic product annually. 700 million people still go outside for education. In India, uh, ladies have to suffer the most, and sometimes uh, they have to face criminal assaults, snake bites, uh, sometimes. It, uh, girls do not go to schools because of lack of toilets. Dr. Patak's Sulab sanitation movement developed a twin pit pour flush toilet system that uses less than a half gallon of water, or 10 times less than a normal flush toilet. Today, over a million Sulab toilets are used in Indian homes and in 7,500 public facilities serving more than 10 million people daily. If you adopt these technologies, then you are saving water, you are saving global warming, you are getting bio fertilizer, and this is eco-friendly. In keeping with Gandhi's vision, Dr. Patak is changing lives for the better for the more than 700,000 people who work as manual scavengers, cleaning human waste from pit latrines. Called untouchables, they are shunned by Indian society. But thanks to Dr. Patak, more than 60,000 scavengers have new jobs, jobs that have more dignity and are more lucrative and a new generation of untouchable children will have a brighter future as a result of the education and training they receive in Sulab-supported schools. Can the U.S. shift to a new energy economy? What is the potential for renewable energy and green jobs? EarthFocus correspondent Miles Benson speaks with Dr. Jonathan Dorn to find out. Jonathan Dorn is a research associate at the Earth Policy Institute in Washington, D.C. Dr. Jonathan Dorn, you and others have been writing very excitedly about the development and the momentum being gathered by uh, the shift to new energy economies and new industries. Uh, has that been stopped in its tracks by the economic turmoil that suddenly hit the world? The economic meltdown has slowed the development of renewable energy sources down, but if we look at the underlying reasons as to why there was this sudden you know, surge in the development of renewables, the underlying reasons are still there, and those being 
climate change, trying to address the climate crisis, and the emissions of carbon, because a lot of the renewable energy sources are very low carbon or no carbon sources of energy. How do you think the new Obama administration is making progress? The Obama administration is trying to push forth renewables for not only job creation, but in stabilizing the climate situation that we're in. Parts of the plan, I think, as far as the total energy plan are a little bit misguided, though. Um, one, the Obama administration is still supportive of clean coal. There's no such thing as, as clean coal. If we actually you know, look at the, the total you know, life cycle of, of coal, you have to mine coal from mountains in, in Appalachia, you know, out in Montana. It's a very dirty business. I mean, in Appalachia, they're basically blowing off the tops of mountains to extract this coal. And so when you talk about clean coal and just using that term to mean that eventually you're going to be able to capture the carbon emissions and bury those carbon emissions, that's really very misleading. That there are really no commercial scale plants in the world that are operating today that can actually capture the carbon. And another thing is that he's really promoting the use of, of biofuels. The U.S. is diverting so much of its corn crop to producing ethanol that it's actually destabilizing global food prices. And so, in effect, by subsidizing the production of corn-based ethanol in the United States, we are increasing our insecurity. Are there a lot of job opportunities in the green economy? Can you put a number on them? If we look at pushing in about $500 billion in, in federal aid, then what we would see is somewhere in the order of uh, 3 million jobs created and maintained all the way through 2020. And so when you hear some of these job numbers like 3 million from the Center for American Progress and the Obama administration, what they're referring to a lot of times is, is kind of a short-term job creation. So these are jobs that would be created over the next couple of years, and then you'd have to keep stimulating to maintain those jobs. What are the implications of a green economy in third world developing nations? When we look at the developing world, it's still staggering to think that 1.6 billion people in the world don't have access to electricity. And if we look at how they actually try and get by for, for lighting, a lot of the people, probably 1.5 billion, so almost all of those people use kerosene lamps. These uh, kerosene lamps are highly polluting. And so if you're in a closed room environment and trying to use these kerosene lamps, which are very, very dim, they're emitting out different sulfate particles and, and nasty uh, particulates. And it's equivalent to smoking about two packs of cigarettes a day. And so if we look at the, the total world consumption of kerosene in these lanterns, it's actually about 1.3 million barrels a day. This is about half of the oil output of Kuwait absolutely staggering. And so if you look at the amount of carbon emissions that are occurring from these little kerosene lanterns, if we look at uh, residential lighting, even though these lanterns only put out uh, less than 1% of the, the light generated in, in the world economy for lights, that actually emits 29% of the CO2 emissions in the residential sector for lighting. And looking at the green economy, especially what solar power can do, Solar power is unique in the fact that it is a distributable source of energy. And so you can actually take a solar panel and put it on a house or a hut or right outside, and you're actually generating the electricity right where you need to use it. It doesn't require the transport of electricity across an electrical grid. So you're reasonably optimistic that if economic recovery comes down the road, we'll be right back in business in the green economy. Yes, I'm absolutely optimistic. I think that what we're seeing um, in the different you know, areas around the world and, and the progression of renewables and the speed with which it's occurred, that um, one has to be optimistic. Thank you very much, Dr. Dorn. Thank you. It has haunted British hospitals for years, but now another strain of MRSA is spreading in the Netherlands, and it is closely related to our insatiable appetite for cheap meat. The ecologist visited the Netherlands with the Soil Association to find out more. The Netherlands has more farm animals per square kilometer than any other country on the planet. 
and between 30 and 50 percent of farmers in the Netherlands carry MRSA. Willy Bijs is a vet based near Eindhoven. Jen, uh, you must not have to worry about it. But today or tomorrow, then I come here in the hospital to see you. And then, yeah, they want to help you. And if they don't help you, then there's a problem. Plus, uh, you can also get bitten by other animals, by other dogs. Oh, yeah. okay. It's a fact. 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 It's a is a deadly bacteria. It frequently causes pneumonia, bone infections, and endocarditis in the most vulnerable members of society. We see here in our region is that we have a, a rise of MRSA positive patients, um, and that uh, we, we go from an average of 40 or 50 MRSA positive patients in this entire region a year to last year 224, and about 60% of those are animal related MRSA. Research shows that the rise in MRSA bacteria from farms is no coincidence. That the cyclins, more or less all over the world, it's one of the most used antibiotics in animal production. Also, the typical feature of the animal-derived MRSA that we this 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 clone that is spreading in in animals now, is that it's always tetracycline resist. Tetracyclines are the most used antibiotics. And so it's, it's likely, we don't know that for sure yet, but it's quite likely that this usage of tetracyclines is one of the reasons that these MRSA are so com commonly present. Over half a million kilos of antibiotics are used in the Netherlands to treat livestock every year. Female pigs are given the drugs an average of twice per month. And campaigners claim that the excessive use of antibiotics is closely related to the conditions on the farm themselves. They are so stressed and so um, bored that uh, they get sick. Their physical uh, health is suffering from their living conditions. And the only solution that farmers see is to put more antibiotics instead of changing those living conditions. And what you see in the Netherlands is a tendency that farms get more intense, that they get larger, that uh, a farmer has less time to spend with individual animals and that they use antibiotics as a treatment for animals to prevent from getting sick. Hans Donkers has seen both sides of the argument. After a disease outbreak, he converted his farm to organic status, a practice that forbids the widespread use of antibiotics. Uh, the pigs have more natural resistance. And um, what I do different as before, I uh, separate a pig first so he can rest. and. Uh, recover uh, better. What I also do is um, uh, use herbs to treat a pig and, uh, before I uh, use anti antibiotics. Uh, the pigs are um, healthier, they uh, have less stress and uh, also um, uh, the bill of the fat is uh, very, uh, very little. The pig industry, however, disagrees. Op emotionele gronden wordt er geroepen door een aantal organisaties die de varkenshouderij liever zien te verdwijnen uit Nederland. Van ja, groot is per definitie ongezond, maar dat is onzin. Ja, omdat je spreekt over ja, toch relatief grote aantallen dieren, zeker bij varkens. Uh, ja, uh, als dieren ziek zijn en als ze behandeld moeten worden, ja, dan zie je toch ook uh, heel snel dat er uh, veel kilogram uh, antibiotica ingezet moeten worden. En daar schrikken uh, varkenshouders van en ook de buitenwacht schrikt daarvan. Want ja, veel dieren betekent uh, dat, dat, dat je toch veel medicijnen moet gebruiken. De pork industry has a lot to lose. The Netherlands exports over a million tons of factory farmed pork abroad every year, and it is an industry worth in excess of 2 billion euros to the rural economy. What we see is that animal health and the use of antibiotics in farming is the domain of the Minister of Agriculture. And from our experience, the Minister of Agriculture is more acting like a marketing manager of the meat industry. And that's what worries us more and more because the, the marketing of meat is a is conflicting with what we need for a sustainable agriculture and a better treatment of animals. 12% of the pork consumed in the UK comes from Dutch farms. And evidence suggests that as much as 10% of that meat carries MRSA bacteria. It is rapidly becoming a global problem. Outbreaks of MRSA in pigs, turkeys, poultry and cattle have also been recorded in Austria, Belgium, Canada, 
Denmark, Germany, Singapore, the USA and Spain. The government has to wake up and start looking after the interests of ordinary people and not just the intensive livestock industry and the multinational drug companies. And it's simply not acceptable to allow methods of food production which take away one of the biggest advances in medical science ever, and that's our ability to treat and cure serious infections in the human population. And I'm afraid we're sitting on a really serious time bomb here, which most people simply know nothing about. America's national parks are our natural and historic legacy. The 391 parks in the national park system house much of our biological diversity and many important historic and archaeological sites. Today, parks are under threat. Earth Focus correspondent Miles Benson speaks with Dr. James Nations to find out why. Dr. Nations is vice president of the Center for the State of Parks at the National Parks and Conservation Association in Washington, D.C. The center assesses the health of America's parks. Is there any significant evidence that the people of this country are more or less interested than they used to be in, in national park efforts and, and uh, establishing them and maintaining Absolutely. them? Absolutely. I think people are waking up to the fact that these are the most important natural areas, these are the most important historical sites in the country, and we need to keep those alive for all generations. We're now approaching the second century of the national park system, 2000. 16, we're going to celebrate 100 years of the national parks and look forward to the next 100 years and beyond that. You have to consider that the national parks represent our heritage, they represent our soul. These are places that range from Independence Hall in Philadelphia where the Declaration of Independence was signed to Mesa Verde in Colorado where uh, indigenous people built their adobe and stone houses up in the cliffs represents the history, the cultural traditions of the United States, but it also represents the grandeur of the United States. Everything from sunrise on Half Dome at Yosemite to the underwater coral reef at Everglades National Park. So these are our gems. These are the places that we want to protect for all time. Well, the notion originally was that we'd set aside land in its pristine state to be preserved for all time for the right. enjoyment of the people. Right. Uh, you're saying it's being threatened now by outside sources. Part of the reason for that is that we're not giving the National Park Service the staff and the money that they need to do the job that America is asking them to do, which is keep those gems alive into the 21st century and beyond so that my children and grandchildren, your grandchildren can go into those parks and see the same thing that we see today. See the wildlife walking across the snow at Yellowstone. See flamingos coming into land in Biscayne National Park. That's an investment. That is a heritage that we need to keep alive. You talk a little bit about the uh, problem with pollution, uh, mm. climate change, and the threats that uh, are posed to the parks from the outside right. in that respect. I went to uh, Big Bend National Park in my home state of Texas uh, last year and saw that the mountains that I could see 35 miles away, the Chisos Mountains inside the park when I was a boy, are now nothing but shadows in a haze. And that's because of air pollution that's coming in from coal-fired power plants. National Park Service did a study to figure out where is that haze coming from, where is that pollution coming from. They found out that the majority of it was coming from the United States, from East Texas, and even from the Ohio Valley. It's disappointing to see a park, Lake Clark National Park and Preserve in Alaska, that got among the highest scores that we saw doing assessments of 80 parks. Absolutely pristine park with wildlife populations, grizzly bears, I stood on the beach in Lake Clark one day and counted 13 grizzly bears at one time. An amazing place, and yet there is a proposal right now that National Parks Conservation Association is learning about in which a Canadian <clears throat> mining company proposes to dig the largest gold and copper open pit mine in the Northern Hemisphere, right on the border of Lake Clark National Park. The impact of that is not only visual, You've got this amazing national park, and right next to it, you've got the largest open pit mine in North America. But mines are not so much a problem for what they take out, it's what they leave behind, which are the tailings that you pile up, would create 
one of the largest earthen dams in the world. The water pollution seeping out of those tailings into the streams that feed Lake Clark National Park is a challenge because of the wildlife. Downstream, the potential is for that pollution to go into Bristol Bay, Alaska, which has the richest population of sockeye salmon any place in the world and one of the most productive economic fisheries any place in the world. How much additional funding every year do you imagine they'll need? The best studies indicate that there is a $750 million shortfall every year for the national park system. L less than a billion. Less than a building, yeah. Seven hundred. That seems like a small change in this day and age, but, but when you consider again, all the other things that we spend money on, it seems like a wise investment to me. The the real irony in this is that national parks are not an economic sink; they're actually economic engines. How so? We did National Parks Conservation Association did a study of the economic value of national parks, and we found that on average, every park dollar that goes into a national park, every taxpayer's dollar returns four dollars in um, visitors coming in from other parts of the United States, international visitors coming in, spending money on hotels, on bottles of water, on lunch, on uh, transportation. Some of the parks, um, Zion National Park, Gettysburg up in Pennsylvania, return up to $14 for every dollar that we invest. Why wouldn't we want to keep that investment alive, especially in a time of, of economic stress? Mr. Nations, do, do you expect the anniversary of the National Park System in mm. 2016 uh, to be something that the entire nation is going to celebrate or is it going to be a wake? Oh, no, I think it'll be a great celebration because uh, Americans are becoming alert, increasingly alert to the fact that we have an amazing park system. We have 391 units that represent our history and the best of our natural environment and people are realizing these are ours, they belong to us, and we need to protect them. So the year 2016, when the park system celebrates its 100th year anniversary, I think will be a great year and great decade. Mr. Nations, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Miles. Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs. Programs which connect you to the world. To learn more, visit linktv.org.